Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Precambrian, Cambrian boundary sections out in the southwest part of the U.S., so in California and Nevada. These are some of the Ediacaran body fossils that we've recovered from two sites in Nevada. And I'd like to acknowledge some co-authors. So I've, I'm presenting a few different projects here. They're all related, but most of what I'm going to be presenting today was done with the help of Lyle Nelson, Sarah Tweed, Hans Zeng, and Jeremiah Workman. So much. Um, so yeah, I'd also like to acknowledge a bunch of people who helped out with various aspects of this project as well as funding sources. Okay, so I'm going to move through some of these intro slides very quickly. Most of you are, I hope, familiar with the Ediacara biota. But here's an artistic rendition of what Ediacaran oceans, a crowded Ediacaran ocean, might have looked like. And generally, they're soft-bodied, large, morphologically complex enigmatic organisms that are collectively referred to as the Ediacara biota. And the phylogenetic affinities of many of these organisms are not known. And so instead, back in 2003, Wagner categorized the different morphal clades of Ediacara biota and plotted them according to temporal constraints at the time. And what he concluded is that, or what he proposed, was that there were three different assemblages of Ediacara biota, the oldest being the Avalon assemblage, middle being the White Sea, and the youngest being the Nama assemblages. And th this has since been updated by Mark Laflemme and Tom Bogg. And it still seems to stand that there are three different Ediacara biota assemblages. And one question that's come out of this is, do these assemblages reflect true biotic turnover? Or instead, do they reflect provinciality um, geographic bi paleogeographic bio biases or paleoenvironmental biases. So in addition to the Ediacara biota, as we just uh, heard from Ben, is that there are a number of tubular taxa that are around during the late Ediacaran. So it's not just Claudina. Claudina has been known for decades, but it's a variety of tubular forms. So here's Multicana tubus, which was just recently published, as well as some tubular forms from Nevada that I'll be talking about and from South China. There are many others. Some have termed this, these, this assemblage of tubular organisms as warm world. Um, but the point is, is that it's not just Claudina. There are a variety of forms, both biomineralizing and soft-bodied tubes around at the close of the Proterozoic. So the picture that's emerging is that there's both Ediacara biota as well as tubular body fossils that are around from a roughly 550 to 540 million years ago. And one question is, how are these two very different groups of organisms interacting or not interacting? Are they stratigraphically overlapping or not? Are they ecologically overlapping? If so, what's the nature of that? For how long? So there are some exceptions to this, but by and large, both the Ediacara biota and these tubular organisms disappear at the base of the Cambrian. And there have been three classes of hypotheses. There are a few others, but the three that I'm going to focus on right here, the three classes of hypotheses that have been proposed to explain the disappearance of the Ediacara biota are summarized right here. This is a nice figure um, schematically illustrating some of these, these three different hypotheses. So the first is the catastrophe model. And this posits a, a rapid environmentally driven extinction that's analogous to Phanerozoic style extinctions. And so you can see the, red, the vertical red dashed line that marks the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary. And there's some very rapid environmental perturbation in which the Ediacara biota are wiped out and the tubular organisms are hit. The second model is the biotic replacement model, internal reorganization. So this, this posits re inter, uh, biotic replacement via ecological engineering. So in that second model, you can see the metazoan ecosystem engineers are gradually outcompeting the Ediacara biota. So this would be a more gradual transition, a gradual extinction event happening over millions of years. And then, of course, these two are not mutually exclusive. And so there could be both things happening. Um, so that's the, com the third scenario, the combined scenario. Part of the problem with trying to test these hypotheses is that when I go out to the rock record, it's not always that easy to put my finger on a specific horizon and say, this is the Precambrian Cambrian boundary. And part of why that is, is this trace fossil, Triptychnus pedum, how the boundary is defined, is not, the FAD of it is not always right at the boundary, as we've heard today from other talks. So in some se sections globally, it's preserved hundreds of meters above where we think the boundary actually is, based on secondary chronostratigraphic markers. And so part of my goal, to be able to try to test these hypotheses, was to better calibrate some of the changes that are happening across the Precambrian Cambrian boundary. So this, this figure by Marshall illustrates some of these changes. So there's perturbations to the carbon cycle. 
um, this pointer, I don't know if it doesn't seem to be working, but you can see the large negative delta C13 excursion, the Sharam excursion, followed by the late Ediacaran positive plateau, and then there's the base, the basal Cambrian negative carbon isotope excursion, followed by high frequency perturbations in the earliest Cambrian. So that's one change. There jumps in disparity and diversity. The Ediacara biota disappear from the fossil record. There's vertical bioturbation, and there's the widespread appearance of skeletonized taxa, um, both Claudina and small shelly fossils. But the question, in order to be able to understand mechanisms and to be able to test these hypotheses, we need to be able to resolve all these stratigraphic changes at a higher resolution. We need to say, we know generally these things are happening across the Precambrian Cambrian boundary, but we need to be able to correlate sections and um, place these different stratigraphic changes into a more precise relative and radiometric framework. So that was one goal. And so I was trying to figure out where to go to be able to do this, to, precise, to calibrate these records more precisely. And that took me to the Southwest US. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about two sites in Nevada, starting with Mount Dunphy, and then I'm gonna focus on the Montgomery Mountains. But these strata are exposed across the Southwest US, so both in California and Nevada, and if I have time at the end of my talk, I'll present more sections. <clears throat> so I think many of you in this room have seen me talk about Mount Dunphy, but this is one slide summarizing the results from Mount Dunphy. So we went out to Mount Dunphy, and I went there because there were many of these stratigraphic markers in a single section. Claudina was there, the late Ediacaran positive plateau was there, the basal Cambrian negative excursion was there, and there's T the FAD of Tepetum. So I apologize, this pointer, oh, maybe this will work. Yes. Okay, so here's Claudina. The LAD of the calcifying tubes is here. Here's the FAD of Tepetum. This is the late Ediacaran positive plateau and here's the basal Cambrian negative excursion. So we went out, measured a bunch of sections, put together a composite curve, and placed all these things in a temporal framework. And while we, while we were doing this, we found two new horizons containing Ediacaran body fossils. So this lower horizon has Galgeshania cast in molds. We found dozens of these, with tubus and problematic, lightly pyrotized vermicular forms, such as this. The upper horizon has um, conotubus, so this is a cloudinid, and it's preserved within the negative basal Cambrian excursion. So at the time we argued that this was the definitive, the youngest definitive cloudinid in the fossil record, and after hearing Ben's talk and some other work, we now know that that's not the case. Um, but we're tightly, the goal was tr to try to tightly constrain the last appearance of cloudinids, the basal Cambrian excursion, as well as the FAD of tepetum. Okay, so now I'm gonna to jump to the Montgomery Mountains. <clears throat> the, um, I should mention, this is a more proximal section, so it's, it's shallower. The deepening direction at the time was to the west, northwest. Uh, these two, so this is a transect across the basin, the Precambrian Cambrian basin. And uh, the units, the formation names are different, but generally they're correlative. Okay, so here's the stratigraphy. So I'm focusing on the Wood Canyon formation right here. The Ediacaran Cambrian boundary is placed in the lower member of the Wood Canyon formation, so it's right here. The FAD of Tepetum is right above that. And it coincides, again, with this large negative carbon isotope excursion, which I'm showing here. The other thing I want to mention is that the lower member records a shallow marine environment in which there are three shallowing up parasequences, each of which is capped by a tan dolomite marker bed. And I've marked those one, two, three. So the facies between those three parasequences are relatively similar. This was known already, and I was just reproducing this data. This is my data, but it's reproducing what others had done. While we were out there, I measured about 70 meters and put to, again put together a composite section. And again, we found new Ediacaran body fossils. So we, we found both tubular body fossils as well as Ernietta morph fossils. And so just to bring you back to one of those early slides, we have both the tubular organisms as well as the classic Ediacara biota. So here are some of the tubular fossils. There's Conotubus, Corumbella, Gajashania, and then some problematic tubular forms. Um, some of them are pyrotized, secondarily pyrotized, while others are cast in molds, such as this one right here. This is the first report of pyrotized, pyrotized fossils from Death Valley. Um, 
the main thing I want to highlight here is that even though we don't know what these are, or we don't know how to phylogenetically classify a lot of these organisms, any of these organisms really, the point is that there is morphological diversity of macroscopic tubular fossils preserved here and globally. So here's the, the cone and cone structure. This one has a tetraradial twist down its main axis. These show no evidence for tapering, and they have transverse annulations. This one is an incomplete specimen, and it's over six centimeters long. It's a really big tube. This one, you can see, it has a greater length to width ratio. So there are different forms represented here. And by and large, these tubes are not found in early Cambrian strata. And there, as, as we've heard in the last talk, there might be some exceptions, so some Claudina-like fossils found in early Cambrian strata. But by and large, these fossils, as well as some of the other tubular fossils that have been found globally, are not found in early Cambrian strata. Okay, there are also the new erniatomorph fossils, and you'll notice that they stratigraphically, so here are the tubes, and these erniatomorphs stratigraphically overlap with the tubes. So here's a slab con containing these erniatomorphs. So here's another image of it, and I've lifted up part of the slab in this image, and here's a line drawing, it was done by Han Zhang. And it's the single slab that has the best preserved specimens, but we have at least five Erniata. There's a problematic cross-hatched fossil that you can see right here, and three smooth cobble-sized clasts. The infill of each Erniata is medium-grained arenitic sandstone, similar to the surrounding matrix. So it's similar to the preservation that's been found in Namibia, or as Dolph Seilacher called it, it's a, a rock and a sock. And in one Erniata, a suture line is present and exhibits branching towards this class. So you can see that right here, the suture line, and it's opening up towards this class right here. I should, I should mention that Erniata has been described from the southwest US, but it's only been described by Hordisky in two abstracts, GSA abstracts from the 90s. It's never been figured in a publication. So it's only been known from Namibia um, outside of those abstracts. So here are just some more zoomed in images of the Erniata. Um, you can see I've lifted up part of the slab here and exposed another Erniata inside. And then here's this, this one Ernietta that's branching. The arrow's pointing to where it's branching. So here and here. Unfortunately, the slab, this slab right here was found in float on a hillside, but we have found poorly preserved specimens um, in situ on, on that same hillside. And so here are some examples of the poorly preserved specimens. Most of them are preserved in 3D like this with faint ridges on the sides. Here, these look almost like deflated sacs. And here, there's some fine lineations along the side of this that are different. Um, we tentatively assign this to Erniatomorpha. So the point is, is that there's stratigraphic and ecological overlap between these very, two very different groups of organisms, the tubular organisms as well as the classic Ediacara biota. Um, these data biostratigraphically link latest Ediacaran assemblages globally. So a number of these fossils have been found in isolated places globally, but never all together. And so they, they link places such as Namibia, South China, Brazil, Paraguay, Siberia. Um, and it shows that there is true bio, biotic turnover within the Ediacaran across the White Sea assemblage into the Nama assemblage. And then finally, that this, this assemblage is a distinctive cosmopolitan biotic assemblage at the close of the Proterozoic, and that's, this is a global phenomenon. And these are existing, both the Erniatomorphs as well as the tubule organisms are existing right up to the Precambrian Cambrian boundary, right up to that basal Cambrian negative carbon isotope excursion. So what about the nature of the NDD acron extinction? And as Malian, so this is a uh, figure from Malian's paper, as, and Ben also talk, touched on this, but there's overlap between Claudina and early Cambrian small shelly fossils. That's been demonstrated. So there is some degree of biostratigraphic overlap between these, what, are, what were originally thought to be distinctive Ediacaran and distinctive early Cambrian organisms. But what we have in the southwest U.S. is that all the fossils that have been reported, so we have 11 beds, and they're all reported from below or within the basal Cambrian negative carbon isotope excursion. And despite there being similar facies above, so in these two para sequences up here, no body fossils have been found. So in the southwest US, the disappearance of morphologically diverse um, assemblage of tubular fossils, as well as erniatomorphs, 
it appears to coincide with a large negative delta C13 excursion. And there does appear to be some degree of biotic turnover coinciding with an environmental perturbation, that basal Cambrian negative carbon isotope excursion. So the conclusions are is that there is an ediacaran, there are ediacaran body fossils, body fossils preserved in the southwest US. So this part of the world was long thought to be devoid of ediacaran biota. And here I'm showing that there are a number of different types of fossils, and some of them are exquisitely preserved. And so it's, I think it is a great place to study the pre-Cambrian Cambrian boundary, and more people should be going out there to look at these sections. Um, the Montgomery Mountain Assemblage is the first report of many of these fossils from the same stratigraphic section, providing a biostratigraphic link between latest Ediacaran assemblages globally, and providing support for a distinctive cosmopolitan late Ediacaran biotic assemblage. So I'm arguing that there is turnover between the White Sea assemblage and the Nama assemblage, and that there is this distinctive biotic assemblage comprised of both Ediacara biota and these tubular fossils that are ecologically, stratigraphically over overlapping for millions of years at the close of the Proterozoic, right up to the basal Cambrian negative carbon isotope excursion. And then finally, the, the data from Nevada, both from Mount Dunphy and from uh, the Montgomery Mountains, represent the tightest relationship documented to date between a large delta C13 excursion and biotic turnover at the boundary. And so any explanation invoked for the ND diacron extinction should account for synchronicity between some degree of biotic turnover and an environmental perturbation. Do I have t time for a couple more slides or no? Yeah. yeah. So just some future work. So here are the two sections that I presented. So this is Mount Dunphy. Here's the Montgomery Mountains. And we now have sections from across the basin. So this is a transect from the more proximal sections in the south, um, southeast part of Death Valley into the more offshore sections in Esmeralda County in Nevada. We can, we can begin to correlate these sections. So I'm showing that with the tie lines. And then we can place these Ediacaran body fossils within this context. So I'm showing that it's not just these two sections that have Ediacaran body fossils, but they're more. So here I have the Ernie Etamorphs in the green symbol. There are algal fossils that were reported by Roland and Rodriguez. And then I'm lumping all the Ediacaran tubular body fossils together just to simplify this a bit. And then layered on top of that, we can, we can overlay uh, the different taponomic windows. So we have five different modes of preservation. And we can start um, asking questions about where these different organisms are getting preserved and how, and put that into a spatial framework as well as a sequence stratigraphic framework. So I'll end right there and take questions if I have any time. Thanks for your attention. Okay.